coming to you from the Hudson Media Group studio. This is Talking Politics, and I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, Top 100 Latino, Vila Latino Spirit Online Magazine, and of course, your favorite conservative, Fernando Uribe. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be back here in the studio filming another episode after a little bit of a hiatus, and uh, it's great to see the weather getting a little bit warmer. And as always, you know there's a lot to discuss here, so let's get started. Here's what I'm thinking about right now. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the midterm election season. And as you know, certainly whether it's House seats in New Jersey or all across the country, as well as U.S. Senate seats, there's a lot to talk about here during this first midterm election. And certainly here in the Garden State, there is no shortage of media establishments and media news sites to cover it all. I've talked about it incessantly on this program since it began in April of 2019, but we all know that the media establishment here in New Jersey is overrun by the left. Whether it's Uncle Dave with NJPBS, Maxi Pizarro, even little J.J. Lasso with Insider NJ, or even, you know, Tommy Boy, Tom Moran with the Star Ledger, there's no shortage of liberals looking to opine during any election season. But thankfully for all of you, your favorite conservative, here, Fernando Uribe, will sort of separate fact from fiction and help you sort of dissect exactly what we should be worrying about during this midterm election. And of course, you know, when we talk about the service that the left does to us on a daily basis in a variety of different institutions, of course, we have to start off with the media. And here in New Jersey, I can't find a more culpable uh, person or group when it comes to bad journalism, then Insider NJ. Now, let me just preface this by saying that, yes, I worked for Insider NJ for three years, and certainly I'm glad not to be there anymore after some creative differences with their editor-in-chief, Maxi Pizarro. But it doesn't mean that I can't criticize them and, again, remain intellectually honest like I always do on this program, as well as my other podcasts during the week on other platforms. But, of course, folks... Last week, there was just a column that really just boiled my blood because somehow somebody thought this was good to run. Now, let me preface this by saying that the column is by Alan Steinberg, a uh, retired former EPA employee, and certainly someone who is a very good journalist. So let me just put that out there because I love you, Alan, and we're friends off the air, and we agree to disagree a lot. You've been a guest on my other shows, and you're always a gentleman. But you're just blatantly wrong here. So let me just give you some tidbits about the latest column that somehow he felt fit to write and somehow Insider NJ felt fit to publish, which is just blatantly dishonest about what's going on during this election cycle. Now, the the article is titled The Prime 2022 Midterm Republican Vulnerability. Quote, it's not anti-abortion, it's misogyny, stupid. So let me just give you a little bit of background here. Now, we can all go back to the presidential election season of 1992 in which Democrat Bill Clinton defeated the incumbent, President George H.W. Bush. Now, that was the election in which the famous Democratic consultant, James Carville, carved the slogan, quote, it's the economy, stupid. And as we all know, that's what drove that presidential election, right? Taxes were being increased. The economy wasn't doing so well. And of course, James Carville came up with that phrase and it has sort of endured ever since. Now, the slogan has a compelling underlying message. First, that the economy was indeed in terrible shape warranting the removal of the president from the White House. Just as significant, though, however, was Carville's obvious emphasis that that the Democrats should focus on nothing else but the economy. He was sort of weighing in against his fellow Democrats' view that bringing other issues into the campaign would divert attention from the winning economic message. Now, again, according to Alan Steinberg in 2022, the GOP has developed, quote, a values vulnerability, Jesus Christ, which may be just as fatal to its prospects in this year's midterm elections as it was concerning economic vulnerability in the presidential election of 1992. That vulnerability can be summarized in one word, misogyny. The word, quote, misogyny is defined as dislike of, comma, contempt for, comma, or ingrained prejudice against women. And you can read the rest of the comma on your own. I'm not going to bore you with it. But this is, again, how myopic and tone deaf journalists like Alan Steinberg are, and of course, Insider NJ for publishing this. Alan, I love you, but I got to call you out on this. Bro, there's nothing misogynistic going on, okay? That's what you, because again, you you swear you're a Republican, right? And I get it. You served under George W. Bush in the 2000s in the EPA, and you still identify as a Republican. Well, Newsflash Allen, you're not a Republican, and you're not even a conservative. You have yet to ever criticize this joke of a president that we have right now with rising gas prices. Folks, it's over $5, and Memorial Day weekend's approaching. The summer months are coming. People are going to be driving down the shore into Pennsylvania, who knows where, 
it's not going to make for a good commute wherever you're going. Secondly, we have inflation, right? At the highest it's ever been since the early 80s. Three, now we're having a shortage of baby formula. Well, guess what? As mothers are now dealing with their newborn baby or babies, they're finding it difficult to feed their children. And of course, wages are still stagnant because, of course, inflation as well. There are tons of other things to to sort of cite here about what's going wrong during this election season. But yet Alan Steinberg, Maxi Pizarro, and the other insufferable journalists at Insider and Jay want to talk about misogyny. There's nothing misogynistic going on. You're, you, all you're doing is deflecting from the obvious issues that matter to New Jersey voters. And at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it's about pocketbook discussions. It's about those kitchen table talks that you have with your family that is really dominating this news cycle, or should be if they're being intellectually honest. But of course, again, Alan Steinberg, along with Maxi Pizarro and Insider NJ, feel that, yeah, let's distract you from the fact that New Jerseyans are going to be paying more at the gas pumps. Because again, it's not going to stop at $5. It's going to keep increasing, right? Or highlighting that somehow, yes, a woman's right to choose is under attack. Folks, I'm not a his- you know, I'm not a, a law professor. I'm a history professor. Okay. So you can see some nice books behind me there. Okay. But let me just say this. What people fail to realize is that when that leak came out earlier this month about a potential decision by the United States Supreme Court where the five justices ruled that ultimately Roe versus Wade, which was decided in 1973, which, by the way, folks, I mean, talk about stretching the 14th Amendment. That's what Roe versus Wade did. Again, you don't need a law degree to know this. I'm a pretty smart guy. I can read. All the decision apparently is going to say is that Abortion is not going to be banned altogether. It's just going to be relegated down to the states. Hmm, I wonder where I read that before. Oh, that's right. It's the 10th Amendment in the United States Constitution. For all of you, you know, constitutional scholars at home, if you remember, that is what is referred to as federalism, right? The invocation of states' rights. Because the founders felt that power in one over, over, overwhelming federal government would be dangerous. Let's have the states have some autonomy and be able to govern themselves. That's at the, at the heart of the language of, the, of federalism and the 10th Amendment. So let the states decide for themselves. So for Alan Steinberg, Maxi Pizarro, little J.J. Lasser, Tommy Moran, and all the other liberal columnists in New Jersey, what are you bitching and moaning about? You sound like all those insufferable feminists and cat ladies that stink of cat piss. Yes, all of them you see outside the Supreme Court and protesting all throughout the state of New Jersey for the last few weeks. Okay, what are you complaining about? You complain about the fact that you can't kill babies in states that you don't live in. Do you see how myopic that looks to anybody that's even rational? That's at the heart of the matter, folks. And that's what they're trying to reflect you with during this election season. Again, it's pocketbook issues. It's not about misogyny. It's not about, you know, chastising Clarence Thomas, who, by the way, I don't believe Anita Hill for for a second. I believe she's about as credible as the Mets winning a World Series later this year. Sorry for all you Met fans, but that's just the truth. Now, as far as Brett Kavanaugh's concerned, that's another guy that gets crucified unjustly as well. Why? I don't know, because maybe past behaviors. What past behaviors? Folks, this is the reality. During the early 2000s, again, for people that need a history lesson, again, your favorite history professor is here to give it to you, Brett Kavanaugh was up for a White House counsel position during the George W. Bush administration. You don't get elevated to that type of position in Washington, much less the executive branch, without the FBI doing its due diligence in investigating and doing a thorough background search and a case history. Now, again, we can all talk about the incompetence of the FBI. There's plenty to pick from. But guess what? He passed the mustard and he served as White House counsel. Now, mysteriously, in 2018, these allegations from, I don't know, uh, Christine Blasey Ford uh, surfaced all of a sudden. I don't believe it. It's garbage. It's BS. But again, Alan Steinberg, Max Pizarro, Tom Moran, Jay Lasser, and all these other insufferable leftists in the New Jersey media landscape won't want to tell you that. They'll just want to gloss over by saying, oh, it's about misogyny. It's about, oh, invading women's bodies. Isn't it really funny that there's a segment of the population, specifically the left, that was all about government being very punitive on your bodies, right? Oh, well, I'm not vaccinated and I'm not going to get vaccinated because I'm fine. And guess what? I got vilified for that. And you know what? I knew I'd win out in the end because two years later, I won. And guess what? Now, all of a sudden, the left wants to pick and choose when government should stay away from bodies of any kind. Well, let me give you a newsflash. Once this decision is rendered in June, and we suspect it will hold up, where abortion will be passed down to the states and then let the states decide. 
Listen, for all the ladies out there, again, all the insufferable feminists and the cat ladies, you don't live in Alabama. You don't live in Texas. You don't live in Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, or wherever else. So what are you worried about? You live here. There's plenty of reproductive freedom. You want to have an abortion in New Jersey, take your pick. Planned Parenthood gets millions of taxpayer dollars from Trenton year after year, yet they cry poverty, for God's sakes. You're fine here, ladies. Your reproductive freedom is not under attack. What more can you choose from here in New Jersey? Don't worry about what they're doing down south. They don't care about what we do up here, right, in the way we coddle illegals, the way we give millions of dollars to illegals, the way we coddle dreamers, right, or illegals, again, not undocumented, illegals, or the way that we raise taxes. Do do you think that Floridians care about what goes on in New Jersey or Texans care about what goes on in New Jersey? Of course not. Don't worry about what they're doing down there. Ultimately, this goes to a state's rights issue. Let the states decide. You don't live there. And for the people that do live in those states, if you don't like it, guess what? You can either try to vote those legislators out or just move to another state. It's that simple. But you'd rather bitch and moan and complain. And this is, again, where Alan Steinberg and the other journalists in New Jersey are doing us a disservice. Okay, they're trying to camouflage this this disastrous economy, this rise in gas prices, inflation, sending millions, billions of dollars overseas to Ukraine, when guess what? We need to address what's going wrong in this country, not overseas. It's funny about the left. They care about Ukrainian borders, but not American borders. Isn't that fascinating, folks, about the left? But again, let me not digress. This is a disservice that New Jersey media does every day to us. And again, one of the biggest culprits is Insider NJ, led by Alan Steinberg. Again, love you, Alan. We're friends. But you know what? Friends have to be able to call each other out when they're wrong. You're wrong. And this isn't the first time either, as well as Max Pizarro for publishing a column like this. When we all blatantly know there are more important things going on for New Jersey voters during this midterm election season. That's what I'm thinking about right now. Now to some local stories for your consideration. And a very interesting op-ed was published last week in the Hudson County View by former Jersey City Council candidate Elvin Dominici. I really want to sort of bring this to your attention. Now, again, shout out to uh, John Hines with with the Hudson County View for publishing this editorial uh, that just came out recently. Now, Elvin Dominici explained why he feels police officers need to be paid better wages to live where they work. Now, Mayor Stephen Fulop has often described the Jersey Police Department as the largest, most diverse, and the most inclusive in the state of New Jersey. Now, since Philip took office in in July of 2013, the police force has increased their recruitment from 779 officers to 975. Now, the fact is that this increase in the workforce has not come without consequences for the new officers trying to serve, protect, and live ultimately in the city that they love. I've had discussions with many of our brave men and women of the Jersey Police Department, and here's the harsh reality. The mayor does not explain to residents that our city government is under pain hence undervaluing members of our police force, which does not give them the opportunity to support their families and ultimately raise them in Jersey City. Affordability and public safety are the two systemic issues that are affecting the diversity once found throughout Jersey City. The lack of affordable housing for members of the Jersey Police Department is greatly affecting the heroes who put their lives at risk every single day to ensure that their their huge responsibility is to ultimately to uphold safety in our communities. Now, the 2020 U.S. Census confirmed that Jersey's household median income is seventy thousand five hundred, excuse me, seven hundred fifty-two dollars. In comparison, the current base salary for a rookie police officer is forty-one thousand dollars, as per the current contract approved between the city and the Jersey City Police Officer Benevolent Association, which was ratified in February 2019. Now you can read the rest of the, the op-ed on your own, ladies and gentlemen. But I have to say, Elvin makes a good point, okay? There are great places to live in Jersey City, whether it's downtown, parts of the Heights, great places to shop, great places to eat, great schools also. But there are places in Jersey City, I mean, you you don't even want to walk in during the daytime, much less the evening. And these are the scenarios and these are the areas of the city that police officers have to patrol every single day and answer calls for, okay? To pay these brave men and women in uniform. These gallant police officers, a wage that is fair and reasonable, is not asking for a lot. Now, again, I'm not privy to conversations or what goes into negotiations between the city on a collective bargaining basis and also the Benevolent Association. Now, again, I'm not sure what the most recent contract, how long it's for, whether or not there'll be pay hikes. But again, Alvin Dominici makes an excellent point about 
Officers need to be paid more. They're putting their lives at risk. Again, folks, just drive down Martin Luther King Drive or Ocean Avenue or Bergen Avenue, okay? Just pass and JCU on Candy Boulevard, not so much on the west side, but just go move to your left and go down those streets. I mean, they look completely decrepit. And I don't care what real, realtor is going to tell me. I don't care what building you put up there. I don't care what developers tell you. Folks, it's not a desirable place to live in Jersey City. It just isn't. And that's not me being bigoted. That's not, being, that's not me gaslighting or whistleblowing. It's not. It's the truth. You don't want to live down there. It's a dump. It really is. And to ask these police officers to go answer calls day and night, and God knows for what. It could be everything from a domestic violence dispute to a burglary to a robbery or worse. Again, pay these officers what they deserve. They're putting their lives at the line every single day. The least City Hall could do is pay them for their troubles and for what they do for the community of Jersey City every single day. And now let's move to the peninsula city of Bayonne for this next story. And many thanks to Daniel Israel from the Hudson Reporter uh, for the publishing of it. Now, the Bayonne branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, is set to hold an inaugural Juneteenth celebration. Now, for those of you that are not aware, Juneteenth commemorates the day in 1865 when Major General Gordon Granger landed with Union soldiers in Galveston, Texas, spreading word that the war had ended and that the enslaved slaves were now free. This was two years after President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, meaning that slaves in the Confederacy remain enslaved until Union troops arrive to enforce the proclamation. Now, the festivities will take place just one day before Juneteenth on Saturday, June the 18th from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. at the 16th Street Park. Formerly known as Thomas D. Dominico Park, the park is located off of Avenue A and 16th Street in the Midtown section of Bayonne. Now, the celebration will be held rain or shine, so if it looks rainy, obviously, I ask you all to grab an umbrella and enjoy the fun, but plenty of fun subsequently will be available at the event for sure. Now, the president of the Bayonne NAACP, Donald Byrd, will offer opening remarks. Writer, poet, and Essence bestselling author and award-winning filmmaker Bill Holmes will be the master of ceremonies. There will be live entertainment, ladies and gentlemen, here, which include legend legendary musician and former Bayonne Board of Education trustee David Doc Watson, with Ambrosia performing jazz saxophone and singing, along with Ronald Onion singing Lift Every Voice and Sing, and Joshua Nelson, a gospel singer in the tradition of Mahala Jackson. All music for the program will be provided by Darren Kinnamore Boston. Folks, this is a, a great opportunity for residents to come out and celebrate Juneteenth. Now, again, my issue, as you know, I'm always going to have an issue with everything because that's why I, I have opinions and I excel in opinion journalism, is like anything else, folks, we know that Juneteenth is is a holiday or we know the significance of it for quite some time. For any, any of you that ever studied U.S. history like I did or have taught U.S. history like I do, understand its significance. Now, we all know that it came under the microscope, right, in the summer of 2020, right, the summer of love, right, when BLM, you know, you know what that stands for, right, like buy large mansions, right? I mean, that's what it looks like lately. Or Antifa were burning federal buildings to the ground or other public and private property during that summer because, you know, hey, we had to be down after we glorified the death of a, uh, you know, career criminal who basically was going to OD on heroin anyway that day of his death. Yes, folks, that's the truth. And I'm sorry, I don't care who this offends. That's the truth. Look at the facts about George Floyd. That's what's, that's what's going to happen on that day. Okay? He had that much fentanyl in the system, he was going to die anyway. Now, again, the reality is, though, folks, that during that summer, we started seeing everything being racialized. We saw parades down Bergen Line Avenue in northern Hudson County. We started seeing people all of a sudden donate to BLM, right? Black Lives Matter. And we all have learned where that money went to, to buy large mansions at the expense of people who donate to the cause as the president or one of the co-founders of BLM has decided to enrich herself after all these generous donations, not not even to mention giving money to her baby daddy and as well as her brother, which has been well documented this week. So for all of you suckers out there that even gave a nickel to BLM, well, that yeah, should serve you right. You know, do a little more research into the organization before that. But of course, during that summer, everything was racialized. We had to, you know, oh, it's wrong that we're not celebrating Juneteenth. This is racist and that's racist. Folks, Juneteenth has existed forever. For whatever reason, during this political climate, 
I guess now we have to honor it with a state holiday or a federal holiday. I know here in New Jersey, it falls on a Sunday. So uh, I, my understanding is it will not be recognized until 2023 where, hey, listen, as a state employee, I don't mind getting a day off. So, I mean, believe me, I'm not complaining. However, it's really funny how everyone sort of was up in a tantrum about the significance of Juneteenth when it's existed forever. OK, under previous presidents and nobody ever had a problem with it. But now that everything has to be racialized and everything has to be about, oh, you know, BLM. And if you're down with this or down with that, folks, I, I could care less about that virtue signaling or all that gaslighting or all that, you know, left wing nonsense. I mean, again, it's a great holiday to celebrate. Great contributions that day. Certainly you want to remember the significance of Juneteenth and making, uh, you know, memories of the fact of, you know, all those all those that were enslaved. Uh, in that region of the country, we're able to have freedom eventually. And subsequently, that was a great thing. Now, again, how it's been politicized and objectified by the left, not just in New Jersey, but throughout the country. Well, nothing surprises me, folks. When it all else fails, racialize everything, play the race card, play the gender card, play this card or that card. It's again, it's, a, it's identity politics at its best. But again, congrats to the Bayonne NAACP for hosting this event coming up in June. Hopefully it's a sunny day. People can come out and enjoy it with their neighbors and friends and family and, uh, again, commemorate the significance of, of Juneteenth. But understand, folks, that this is something that probably could have been commemorated a long time ago and passed under different Congresses, different state legislatures, even different presidencies. So to say that, oh, well, now we have to be down more than ever, folks, it could have been done way before. It just, you know what, there was never a reason to politicize it the way we politicized everything about race since the summer of 2020, again, with BLM, Antifa, and the death of a career criminal that we all know to be George Floyd. So stay tuned, folks. I'm sure there'll be more Juneteenth celebrations throughout the summer months. Let's stay in Bayonne. And once again, a shout out to Terry West with the Jersey Journal for her reporting on this very important story. And after five pedestrians were killed in less than five years on Route 440 in Bayonne, recently Bayonne Mayor Jimmy Davis and congrats to him on winning a third term, said that the city was, quote, committed to building bridges for pedestrians to safely cross the busy roadway. Well, that was more than three years ago. And in those three years, uh, for example, mothers like Heidi Vialta uh, was really spoken uh, very rarely about her son, Christian Rodriguez's death, uh, who was a science-loving, very smart-dressing young man. He would have been 26 by now if his life wasn't cut short while crossing Route 440 in 2018. Two deaths, three deaths, four deaths, five deaths, six deaths, Vialta told the Jersey Journal, how many more? Now, the city indicated it is still progressing on work for a bridge crossing Route 440 at 34th Street. It has selected an engineering firm to begin concept work, the mayor said in a statement recently, and is awaiting federal approval for the contract. Now, the city attributed the project delay to, quote, a number of hoops to go through to use federal funding as well as rail traffic and utilities designed complications. Now, the project will be funded with $4.5 million from the federal government, according to the city. Now, the bridge will connect the 34th Street light rail station to the edge of the former military ocean terminal, where there is now a new shopping center. Folks, again, this is one of the things that really should bother us about municipal government. And I'm not sort of really going after Jamie Davis about this or the city of Bayonne overall, but it's these sort of tragedies that still don't prompt municipalities to act quicker. And I understand federal dollars uh, have not been coming in very quickly. Uh, we know in New Jersey, to some extent, it has how to appropriate that between the 21 counties and the hundreds of municipalities. Well, that in itself is a challenge. It's something I would not even want uh, on my plate. But nevertheless, folks, this is something that should have happened a long time ago. I'm hoping that the city of Bayonne would at least have budgeted for this at some time. Now, if you've ever driven through Route 440, and I have, my dealership where I go get my car serviced at that awful dealership, Chrysler Jeep Plymouth over there, uh, as I've driven through Route 440, I mean, it gets very congested. There's never a day or any period in the evening or therefore or thereafter where it's not an enormous amount of congestion on Route 440. But let me tell you something. I mean, this is where the municipality has to be a little more proactive. Don't just wait for federal dollars to come in. You know, appropriate accordingly within your own means in the city. Okay? It's a shame to see this young man's life cut short and others. And I feel for his mom. You know, to, to know your kid would have been 26 by now in the prime of his life, maybe having just finished college and doing wonderful things. You know, that could have been prevented 
by just being more proactive. And this is the stuff that, again, folks, really pisses me off about some municipalities where they just let things linger and linger and fester and fester. I mean, how many more kids have to die, ladies and gentlemen, on Route 440? Now, again, listen, as someone who comments on other social media pages about the horrendous drivers in Hudson County, I also talk about horrible pedestrians that aren't paying attention or anything else. That's all I'm saying here. I'm not accusing any of the pedestrians. I'm not trying to victim blame here. It's all a combination of everything. But overall, folks, if we want safety in our, in our municipalities, it's got to come from the city itself. So I'm hoping that Mayor, Mayor Jimmy Davis and the city council, again, as they got reelected, will kind of roll up their sleeves and really not just campaign with Trenton, but campaign with the federal government to make sure that these federal dollars come to Bayonne as soon as possible. Listen, expedite this project. Make sure it gets built as soon as possible. Again, it's the summer months coming up. How much work that will require? Who knows? It might take a year or two longer. Who knows? But folks, the safety of our kids, you can't put a dollar value on that. And you can't really minimize it in any way. So I'm hoping that the city of Bayonne, again, acts due to, you know, diligently and gets on this and makes sure that this pedestrian bridge finally gets built in his honor and all the other poor people that have died as a result of all the congestion we see every single day on Route 440 in the city of Bayonne. And that's our show for this week. Once again, it's great to be back in the Hudson Media Group studio after a little bit of a hiatus from the winter and spring. And we'll be coming with more episodes here, again, via the Hudson Media Group. Always check out their excellent content at their websites, www.hmgtvshows.com, as well as www.livestream.com slash hmgtv. Don't forget to check out the Hudson Media Group on YouTube as well. Make sure you like them on Facebook and follow them on both Instagram and Twitter. And always remember, ladies and gentlemen, the five-time award-winning podcast, Talking to Hudson, will resume during uh, later on this summer by going to www.blogtalkradio.com slash Talking to Hudson. Recent episodes have included West New York Commissioner Cosmo Cirillo, HCDO Chairwoman Amy DeGees, and many more. Once again, you can check out the episodes from any PC, Mac, smartphone, or tablet, and you can listen to them anywhere at any time. Make sure you like Talking the Hudson on Facebook, of course. Follow it on Instagram, at Talk on the Hudson, as well as this show, at Talking Politics with Fernando Uribe on Instagram. Also, hit me up on Twitter, ladies and gentlemen, at NoFilterUribe. That's at NoFilter, U-R-I-B-E. And also make sure you like Talking Politics and Talking the Hudson on Facebook as well. And always remember, ladies and gentlemen, if it's unbiased, unfiltered, and unafraid, it is always Talking Politics right here with the Hudson Media Group. I am New Jersey's premier award-winning journalist, top 100 Latino, Via Latino Spirit Online Magazine, and certainly your favorite conservative, Fernando Uribe, saying, have a great Memorial Day, weekend coming up, be safe, please party responsibly, and as always, I'll see you next time here via the Hudson Media Group. Take care, everyone.